Cool. All right. Um, I guess we're not going to do an intro. So Tim, just start. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All this right. is. Here we go. We'll do, we'll do the old school uh, journalism trick. There you go. Know. There you go, James. You know when to start. So did we did we start? <laughs> All right. Well, it's sometime in the future from the first time that we ever recorded a show, episode 184. And um we've had some technical problems throughout the challenges, but you know, you just gotta roll with the punches. That's uh kind of like what business is. It's like you think yeah. this is what's gonna happen. It well, it's, it's such a like uh, through I I teach a lot of pitching classes, and so like one of the things that I tell all the people that uh, in these classes is like, never try something for the first time when you're doing a pitch. And uh, it's kind of like that first half marathon I ever ran, and <laughs> I wore different clothes that day. That was the that was one of the worst races of my life. Yeah, you don't ever want to try anything for the first time, like performance time. It. Uh, well, I think it's actually rather perfect that I am your guest today because I I talk about and I work with people about navigating different seasons of life and navigating the unexpected. And that is exactly what the three of us have faced over the past 30 minutes with these techno technology challenges. So it seems like maybe this was all just meant to be. <laughs> we Perhaps. planned it that way. I planned it that way. That was the script. That was the script. So, so. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. <laughs> Sheetal. How how are you? Thank you. I'm doing really well. I'm so glad that, um, you know, after the past half hour that, that we're here today now having this conversation, really grateful for it. Yeah. Now, you know, you just need to walk us off the ledge a little bit. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Like you guys, have people always have these like sayings, and I only know like one out of every ten. Like this, talk, yeah. walk him off the ledge. Talk, I talk us off the ledge is what I meant to say. I see, I'm so flustered, I can't even get the uh, cliches correct. So, go for a run, Tim. It'll fix everything. <laughs> I so, could, so I could guide us through a few deep breaths, certainly, if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, so. Um, well, okay, okay. Uh, you just walked up and down the stairs a couple of times. Like, let's let's say there's no elevator, but you meet someone for the first time, and you're going to give them a stair pitch of what you do, of of, of walking up. Um, you know, similar to an elevator pitch, but in this case, because you're in a building with a lot of stairs, it'll be the stair pitch. What's 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 the stair pitch? Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Uh, so so I'm Dr. Sheetal Jamani. I'm the founder of Radiant Living Institute, and I guide people to get unstuck and learn to live radiantly again, particularly as they are navigating major life challenges and transitions, things such as career burnout, career transition, uh, divorce, empty nest. Um, and I really draw from over two decades of experience of studying Eastern and Western modalities of healing and well-being. So in addition to being a physician, I'm also a certified yoga instructor and Ayurveda consultant. So I really bring in this very holistic approach that combines modern science and Eastern wisdom in my approach in coaching, speaking, and podcasting. Yeah, I'm glad that we were able to make this work because uh, I'm eager to to dive into, into all this because a lot of people are suffering through a lot of a lot of burnout. And I guess if if founders were being honest with themselves and if they're able to be honest with others, they experience a lot of stress and pressures. So I would think that you would be one of their either best friend or maybe they turn around and walk the other way because they don't want to to face reality. Absolutely. I mean, it can be really difficult to even admit that, hey, I'm having a hard time or this is really hard. And I know that from my own experiences, both within medicine, practicing as a physician, uh, and having experienced burnout multiple times there. Um, and then as well as an entrepreneur and just navigating now the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. And I'll be honest, you know, even just over the past few weeks, I was going through a hard time and it's, it, it can be really hard 
to admit that. And I think that's also a really important reason for us to have these conversations and to discuss it so that, you know, one of my big goals is that people know that they're not alone because so often when we're experiencing these things, we can feel very isolated. We can feel very alone. I've certainly felt that way in my own life many times during these challenging situations. And particularly, you know, many of the clients that I work with are used to being high achievers, to achieving things, to um, being really quote unquote successful, which we can go into a whole discussion about about that. I truly believe that we get to define what success means to us. But, you know, from society standards, very successful, high achieving. And so when we're in these situations where all of a sudden we are, you know, there's there's a few components to burnout that the scientific literature discusses uh, overwhelming exhaustion, um, starting to feel a lack of uh, effectiveness in the work that you're doing and feeling disconnected from your job. And so when someone who is very high achieving is starting to feel that you know, lack of effectiveness in their job and inability to show up in the ways that they want to, I mean, that can be really hard to face because that may be something that they're not used to feeling as well. And honestly, that's just a component of of how burnout shows up that the scientific literature shows us and tells us. And I think that can be helpful to know that it's not you. It is what burnout is. And I think that can be really helpful to, to know that, to be able to create some of that space between you and the burnout. And that burnout is not something... Um, reflective of the individual. It is reflective of a uh, normal stress response to a very stressful situation. So what would be the, uh, can you, what are, what are the initial signs of burnout is on the horizon? Pump the brakes. You need to slow down. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be really easy to miss even when you know the signs. And I think part of it is because we tend to keep pushing, 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 pushing through it. And we tend to ignore those signals. So, you know, one thing that I always say in, in all of my programs is that your body is always sending you signals. So really you will start to see these signals within your body and it may start out as subtle, subtle signals, right? It might start out as um, just your stomach feeling a little bit upset or anxious or queasy, right? Or maybe not sleeping great or feeling a little bit like, um, short or irritable with others, with family members or colleagues, right? Uh, so it can start out as kind of these subtle signals. And then it can, if unaddressed, and often when it starts out as those subtle signals, we tend to ignore it. Just many of us, and I, I realize I'm making a generalization, but many of us tend to just ignore it and kind of push on through because that's what society and culture tells us to do, right? It's all about the quote unquote hustle culture, right? Um, and and, you know, work hard and you'll make it, right? With whatever it is, entrepreneurship, whatever it is. And and so we tend to ignore it and we tend to push through that. And then that's when other symptoms can come up, symptoms resembling depression, resembling anxiety, right? Feeling a disconnect, feeling detached from things that you normally enjoy, feeling a disconnect, detached from your work, uh, maybe having even more trouble sleeping. So it can show up a lot of different ways. Uh, and part of that also depends on you as an individual and how stress shows up in your body and in your life. So something that I really love that I draw from uh, the system of Ayurveda, which is the ancient medical system of India, and it's related to yoga. So many people are familiar with yoga. Uh, Ayurveda can be thought of, one way Ayurveda can be thought of is a system of, and a framework of lifestyle, daily habits, routines, and practices to help you be in your optimal state of alignment. And one thing that Ayurveda says is that we are all born with a very unique constitution and composition of qualities, strengths, quote unquote, weaknesses. And what that means is that stressful situations or, or really any sort of life situation can present in your body, mind, and emotions different than it would in mine, different than it would in Zach's, different than it would in Tim's. And what that means is that also the way that we address it in terms of your self-care or management of it 
is different and it needs to be uniquely tailored to you. And that's something that I find very beautiful and very uh, actually different from how the Western model of health and well being is, which sees it as this is the problem, this is how you deal with it for everyone. The Eastern model, the Ayurvedic model, says this is showing up within your body, mind, or emotions in this way, we need to look at kind of the holistic view of everything that's going on, your unique nature, which is different than anyone else's unique nature, and custom tailor a plan for you. And that's what I do when I'm working with my clients. I really meet you where you're at and take a look at all of the things that make you, you, to custom tailor a plan for you. Lovely. Um, I, I love, <clears throat> I love it when it's custom towards someone and, and all that. So as, as you're talking, this, this reminded me of this, um, this series that a lot of people who run go through Tim, Tim's been there from this. It's the, the marathon. A lot of people say you hit mile 20 and you gotta, you gotta push through the mental mindset, the physical, the physical pain of, of mile 20. But as you were, as you were describing, a lot of people will see just in their day-to-days, not necessarily the marathon, but in their day-to-days, they'll miss that or uh, they'll just try to push through. Or you said hustle culture in it. And it's like, you're you're not trying to, I don't know, work through that callus, if you will, get work through that pain. You're saying to address it in that mind, in that moment. Yet from the marathon perspective, when you hit that wall, that mile 20, the mindset is pushed through through it. And so how do you... How do you kind of understand like this is different than the marathon mile 20 wall and this is actually something that and obviously people aren't running a marathon every single day but like i think a lot of people would just be like eh, it's just it's a thing i i get it but i'm just going to push through and not knowing that maybe they should be addressing this in a in a more serious kind of way yeah that is such a great question because we are sort of yeah, taught all of these phrases too, right? Like no pain, no gain, right? That sort of thing. And yeah, sure. so I'm thinking about, so I have run a marathon only once and- uh, Same, <laughs> tried twice. <laughs> so I've run it once. And, you know, I'll, I'll share this story of how I did it. So I, I had always had this dream to run a marathon because I had started running when I was 12 years old. And so- You know the that- guy who ran the first marathon died when he got there? Oh, wow. Do you know the story of how, Tim, you know the story? I, I did hear that. I can't remember where I heard it. I just recently I, heard. I, I, can't, I think it's in Greece, right? So he ran yeah. from one place to another to tell the people. And he ran to this place called Marathon. And that it was 26.2. And by the time he got there, he passed out and died. It's, and then people do it for fun. Like, what are we? Yeah, I want to say, perhaps I heard it on uh, the television series uh, Billions. Oh, okay. And, but then the interesting thing is, is that, uh, one of the characters on that show is a performance coach, which is interesting in this conversation today, but yeah. R- random fact of the day, just had to yeah. throw that out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So, so that, so that's interesting. I feel like there's so much more we could explore there as well, but, but I'll, I'll share sort of my experience of how I, how I completed the marathon and how I actually decided to do it many, many years later. Uh, from when I had first started running, because I had done, you know, then in my like 20s and, and yeah, in my 20s, I did a number of half marathons. And I was like, that's good. Half marathon is good. I don't need to do the full marathon. But then actually just two or three, actually three years ago, it was it was 2020. Um, I was training for a marathon. It was going to be the Shamrock Marathon here, here in Hampton Roads, right in Virginia Beach. And 2020, a week before the marathon, everything went on lockdown. They had to cancel the race. And I was like, I don't know when else (laughs) I am going to spend four months training for a marathon. I am running this race. And so I created my own like virtual, uh, course and I, I ran the race, but the way I did it, the way I ran the race and the way I, and I completed it. And the way I did my training was 
30 seconds running, 30 seconds walking. And this was one of my really good friends um, told me about that when my brothers, you know, my brother told me about that. And this is a method that that has been um, talked about by Jeff Galloway, really big in the running world. But I share that because the entire 26 miles, I did 30 seconds running, 30 seconds walking. What was I doing? I was building in active recovery right? So when we talk about that, and so in response to your question, right, we can push, push, push. And so often we think that if we push, push, push and not rest, we're going to achieve the goal or we're going to have that success. But we need rest just as much as we need to take that intentional aligned action, right? And we know that we know that we are more productive when we take that time to rest. We know that there is so much that goes on in your brain when you sleep to process what you're experiencing through the day to help you actually come up with solutions to help um, de detoxify as well. Um, and so and so we know that we need that time. So in terms of how do you recognize that within yourself, honestly, I feel like it's a bit of, it requires self-awareness. And because we are all different, like your limit is going to be different than my limit, you know? And I think part of it is a couple of things. One, cultivating that self-awareness, which is something that, you know, through through my programs, I help people do that. Cultivating just that self-awareness of your body signals of what's going on in your body, your mind, and your emotions. And another thing too is, second is allowing yourself self-compassion and grace to recognize that, like I mentioned, that you are unique. And just because so-and-so over there is pushing through or what you see on the outside is that they're pushing through and they're achieving this thing doesn't mean that you need to do it in the same way, right? So, and that can be hard to say, hey, I see all these people around me doing this thing in a certain way. But I'm recognizing that this isn't right for me, that this is taking a toll on my body, my mind, my emotions, on my health, on my well-being, on my relationships. And so I'm going to choose to do things differently. And that can be hard. Yeah, there is a lot of pressures to keep up. And especially in terms of like with the, the founder culture, I mean, you're getting pressures from everywhere you, you need to hit the numbers you got to generate revenue you need to extend your runway if you're raising capital then you're just unlocking a whole nother world of pressures that i tell everyone since we're talking about the running uh analogies you know, so you get on a treadmill you set the treadmill at 10 you start running and then you don't get off there is no recovery active recovery period when you start raising capital and so it's like before you decide you want to go down that road you need to be real real clear have a conversation with yourself the people that uh, you're surrounded by to make sure that that's the, the choice that you want to go down because once you're on it you're on it it's a lot of pressure well you could you could hit that little button on the treadmill that says stop you could but I don't know. I, I know. It's best to have that conversation beforehand. I just know that like with me, my, I have, I, my aura ring is like, like I have, that is, it is amazing. Like how they just, they just, this week they added, they track your, your stress. And it, and it, it's remarkable to me, like during the day when something happens and then I'll go and look on the app how accurate it is. Like it'll be a phone call or it'll be something happened. I'm sure that probably today at 11 o'clock I can look. And uh, when we were to record this and go live when it wasn't working, I'm sure that I'll show a sign of stress. Um, but looking at that and tracking sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep, all that, I mean, it's just, I just, I, that is a tool that I use to, to monitor myself, to make sure that I can perform at my highest levels. Absolutely. And so, I mean, that's an example of biofeedback of, of kind of looking at that data as well. And um, a couple things that, that what you mentioned brought to mind for me, you know, one is, yeah, once you're going down that, that path and, and I'm not, 
um, at that stage in my business. And uh, that's not the type of business that I have. That's going to necessarily, at least not now, <laughs> as far as I see it, going to be seeking, uh, you know, venture capitalist um, investors. But the... Um, but what I can equate that to is having practiced medicine for 16 years where I was literally in life, you know, dealing with life and death situations on a daily basis and being pulled in a million different directions all day long. And each of those directions I was being pulled in was a life and death situation and directly affected people's lives, families' lives, children's lives, because I was practicing as a pediatrician. And even in the midst of that, and that's where so much of what I teach and I share and I coach people through comes from, is that I had to find ways to practice self-care, to check in with myself and see how am I feeling? What do I need in this moment before I go on to see that next patient? I just had this really difficult, stressful patient encounter. What do I need before I go into that next room so that I can show up fully? Because this next patient doesn't know what I just dealt with, with my other patient. And it's not fair for me to bring that in to this next room. It's, right? it's crazy. I was thinking about this recently, right? It's like, we talk about how we want people to be at work and, and on point and, and be great. Then you look at doctors or, or surgeons or anyone in the medical field. And it's like, you know, they're going back to back to back to back to back. And we just expect them to be on their A game. Like I never thought of it like that until like literally a week ago. And I was like, this is the most ridiculous thing for us to like be so demanding on these people and to not sit there and be like, well, they did just do a six hour surgery over here. And now they're going to do this. And, and by the way, like that was an emotional thing for them. They're like in it to win it. I don't know if that was the right phrase, but like in it to like be, um, do the thing that they're supposed to do and then, you know, take a little break, you know, get a little coffee and a donut in there. Then they got to go right next to the neck. Like, damn, like that's a wild ride. And then yeah. it's like every family that goes into whatever this is, they're expecting that individual to be at their absolute best. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what they're going through. Like it, it as you were saying that it reminded me when I worked in TV news mm -hmm. and how, not that we're going through as stressful things as, as doctors, but we're constantly meeting people on the worst day of their lives. And most people don't think about how that impacts you, the, you know, the journalist. And I just remember, I used to like talk to, to friends and family. I'm like, they're like, how, why'd you get out? And I'm like, imagine meeting someone on the worst day of their life every single day. Like, mm -hmm. you just don't want to do that. Like, this is, this, this sucks. And so it's, I, I can see how people in that industry probably at least then didn't do anything from like a mindful perspective or, mm -hmm. or go through anything like this, but I think it would be incredibly important for them to, to maybe have some of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so even if it means again, to, to, to also go back to, to the kind of question that, that Tim had brought up earlier of like, if you're, if you're on that path that, you know, seeking investors, you know, as an entrepreneur, or, you know, just on that path and you can't quite get off. Like my whole thing is how can we practice self-care while we're in the middle of it? Because we are all living life every single day, whatever career. And, and I give the example of, of, of me as a pediatrician and in clinic, just as an example of, of where a lot of this came from, because I had to do that. I had to figure out, I am showing up to do this thing that I love. I am showing up to treat and serve these patients and these families, but it is taking a toll on me. So what do I need to do to show up as my best self? And so I'm all about finding those like 30 seconds in your day, that one minute in your day that you check in, that you tune in, cultivate that self-awareness, or maybe it's a gratitude practice, or maybe it's just a few deep breaths, but what is it for you? And, and that's where it can be custom tailored as well to fit your specific situation and finding the practice or the tool that's going to work best for you um, in that situation. But can we make this so that, and this is really the premise of my podcast, which is called Essential Self-Care, is really how can we make self-care a way of life? Not something that you have to like set aside two hours on your calendar every week to go to a yoga class or to get a massage or, you know, that, that it's kind of like, well, I don't have time for that, or I don't have money for that. Right. Or especially if you're like an early founder. Right? <laughs> um, and so, so how can we make this self 
self-care, this self-awareness? How can we bring these tools into our life so that it is just a way of being? And that's what I really enjoy helping people with. And again, that's that's the premise of, of my podcast, Essential Self-Care as well, so that it's not like, hey, you need to just jump off the ham- hamster wheel completely. Maybe it is for a period of time, right? Um, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But also, or and also, can we then still work towards the things that we want to do, still work towards the things that we're passionate about, but also built in the self-care as a way of life and a way of being. And that's what sort of my signature program called Reclaim Your Radiance can also really help people with um, where I've outlined and I walk people through six very specific steps to help them do that. I was just going to ask that very question. It sounds like we're leading into this, the six yet powerful, uh, simple steps. So they, that's, let's dive into, can we dive into those six steps uh, and talk about what they are? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. So I would love to offer that to you and to everyone listening right now. So it's three phases and then two steps within each, each uh, phase. I was about to say phrase. I don't, I don't know why, but each phase <laughs> there's two steps. And so that's how there's six steps. So I call it my radiant living method and what I've coined it the three phases as is car. So to get from wherever you are now, that hustle culture, stress, overwhelm, burnout, whatever it is, to get from where you are now to where you want to go, I propose that we take a car and that car stands for C, clarity, A, acceptance, and then R, rebuilding. So the first phase is clarity. And within that phase, there's two steps. The first step is taking inventory. So that's where I guide individuals through a very specific um, directed series of purposeful questions to really look at, you know, what does your life look like right now? What are the emotions you're experiencing on a regular basis? What do you want that to look like? What do you want your career to look like? What do you want your relationships to look like? Like, what do you want your life as a whole to look like, right? So often especially as founders, we can be so focused on our business and building that and what we need to do for that, that it can be easy to overlook a lot of the other reasons that we're also building a business outside of that, that may be related to our family, that may be related to a certain sort of lifestyle that you want, right? Or that may be related to certain emotions that you think you're going to experience once you achieve said goal, right? So we really take a look at, at, at that. And then because taking inventory is a process that you kind of do in a point in time, right? It's also important that we touch on that clarity on a regular basis as well. And so that's where we move into step two, which is about creating empowering daily routines. That is all about taking moments and it doesn't have to be a long time. It doesn't have to be half an hour a day. It could be one or literally one or two minutes a day to connect with yourself, whatever that looks like for you. For some people that might be meditation. For some people that might be going for a walk outside. For some people it might be sipping on their morning cup of tea without scrolling the phone. So in a state of mindfulness, right? So it could look different for everyone, but basically what it is, is taking that moment to connect with yourself daily, right? Because it's so easy for us to stay distracted in everything else, especially these days with technology, with our phones, just, you know, right at our side all day long. It's so easy to stay distracted in everything else. And so creating empowering daily routines is really about tapping into that inner clarity. You know, I always say, you know, my company's called Radiant Living Institute. I always say a radiant life starts from within. And so it's really taking that moment to, to tap in to tap into your within. Um, And that, you know, that is the foundation for how you show up in all other aspects of your life all day. And how do you do that? Yeah. So like, how do you, how, how do you tap in? And and like, what is that first step? Like, I'm the type of guy, like, I'm just, I'm going, going, going. And then we, we go on vacation and I feel like I'm still going, going, going. And then it's like the last day of the vacation that I'm finally in that spot. And then it's time to go. And it's just like, well, that sucked. I mean, I still enjoyed myself, but you, you understand what yeah. I'm getting at. It's just like, how do you, how do you tap into that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. It does take practice. And, you know, another thing I say is that small, small changes make a large impact. So I always really 
emphasize this when I'm working with my clients is to start small. And, and this can be really hard because many of us are very high achievers. And so we're used to setting really big goals for ourselves, whether that's in business, career, life, whatever it is. But I really emphasize starting small when it comes to these practices and, and practicing self-care, because what happens is when we make small changes, and I'll give you some examples of that too, but when we make small changes, it's more likely to stick. It's more likely to become a habit because you make this small change. It's somewhat easy to implement because you set a really small goal for yourself. You start to notice how you feel. Oh, this feels good. Oh, I like how this feels. Oh, I notice I feel different when I'm not doing this. And that naturally becomes the fuel, the momentum that keeps you going so that it actually sticks as a habit. So that's one key point. Um, so I can share how I started with this when I first started a meditation practice as well. So right now, I'll be honest, right now I have a morning practice that is about an hour that I do every morning. So I realized that might not seem feasible or practical for anyone, for someone listening who maybe doesn't have a morning practice at all. But it wasn't always that way. It's taken 13 years for me to build up to that. Mm -hmm. I started with meditation. It was 2010. I was doing my first yoga teacher training program here in Virginia Beach, actually. And part of the program, it was an eight-month program. And part of the program was that we had to meditate 15 minutes a day. And they gave us a calendar and we had to check off each box on paper of the days that we meditated. And, you know, being the perfectionist that I am, I was like, well, I need to check off every single box. But it was really hard. Like sitting down to meditate for 15 minutes is really hard and that can feel really long. So I adapted that and I was like, well, I'll start off with five minutes a day. And that felt really hard. I would sit down every morning on my yoga mat in my bedroom, set a timer for five minutes. I would open my eyes and see that like two minutes had passed, right? Like it was really hard. But what I started to notice is that the days that I missed it, I felt different. The days that I missed it, I felt like my mind was still racing, you know, more than the days that I did it. I felt like just not as centered, not as grounded. And so I share that example because that was only two to five minutes and I noticed a difference. And so starting small with whatever that looks like for you and with regards to what to start with. Obviously, when I'm working with clients in group settings or one-on-one, -on -one, I can guide you more specifically with it. But as a general thing, what I would say is start with something that you enjoy. So if that is painting, create some space in your life to start painting, whether that's 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, five minutes a day, whether that's writing, do that, right? Whether it's reading an inspiring book, okay, well, maybe it's five minutes every morning with your coffee, you are reading one or two pages of this inspiring book, right? So as sort of a general thing, I recommend start with something you enjoy that maybe you're not making time for right now and just start to create some space in your life for it. I think most people are lying to themselves about having time. I think that if they were to just take a little inventory of their life and see that you know, the hours that they're doing obnoxious things, peel back that a little bit, take your five minutes to do, to do your painting, whatever, to do your meditation, uh, your 15 minute allocated time that you can only get to two minutes for just like you. We have a lot more time available than we think, but I think people uh, don't want to admit that. And I think that can be a challenge, but um, something that I find interesting is that maybe in the last 10 years, maybe it's because of, 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 uh, podcast and, and shows being available, but a lot of this information has been getting out there. You know, I think mindfulness might have been frowned upon and silly to a lot of people. Uh, you know, as I was growing up, it was kind of um, looked at a little differently. But I, but I think because of some science and and some popularity um, behind a lot of people, it has become more of the norm. Right, people are uh, doing Wim Hofs. People are listening to to the Andrew Hubbermans of the world. The science behind that. People are doing ice baths. People are are meditating. Things like a billion dollar company, like uh, like Calm, uh, and, and I think all those things are interesting because there has been a shift where, like I said, decades before, kind of weird. Now it's different. Is have you absolutely. seen that? Like, oh, is, is, absolutely. Like... Absolutely. So two things came up for me with what you just shared. First of all, with regards to the time, 
Um, so I can give you an example, like, absolutely. I think we all tend to, you know, it's, it's easy to say busy and we're, we're so used to hearing people say, oh, I'm so busy. I try to avoid saying I'm busy at all costs. I will say things like I have my schedule's really full today. Can we plan this for next week? But I try to avoid saying busy because I feel like busy just naturally, at least for me, makes me feel stressed and overwhelmed. And I hear everyone saying how busy they are. But let me give you an example. I um, I take dance classes. I've been taking ballet and modern dance classes. And so I reached the studio. Yeah, I love dancing. That's a big part of self-care for me. Um, and so I reached the studio, the dance studio a few minutes early and I was like, okay, I have three minutes until class starts. What should I do? I could have easily opened up Instagram or checked my email, right? Which I do sometimes, right? Cause I'm human. Like I'm not perfect at all this yet either, but this was literally just the other evening. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm just going to sit here in my car and meditate for three minutes until it's time to go in for class. And that's what I did, right? So it's, there are these moments in our life, but we maybe just don't think about it, you know? Um, so that was with regards to the time. And then about just how this awareness on, you know, these practices, mindfulness, self-awareness, it's been changing. So I started practicing yoga my first year of medical school in 2002. And, and at that time, the seed was planted. Like I knew that I wanted to learn more about yoga. I had first heard about Ayurveda that time too. I knew I wanted to learn more about that. That was in 2002. It was still considered very, um, I mean, I think the word that many people use is just kind of like woo-woo and out there at that time, right? It was definitely not mainstream in 2002. I was definitely an outlier. And especially in a field as uh, traditional as allopathic medicine, right? And it's funny, we say traditional because actually yoga and Ayurveda have been, a lot, have been around far longer than allopathic medicine has. Yoga and Ayurveda are traditions that are over 5,000 years old. But but, you know, coming from that that tradition in that field, it was especially considered very sort of kind of out there and, and woo-woo. And even when, um, and even that first year of medical school, I had written on a sheet of paper, East meets West medicine. Like I just always knew there was just this seed that was planted in me, but I was definitely an outlier in all of that. And, um, and you know, I've been talking about this stuff since 2002, certainly since I graduated pediatric residency in 2009. My first job out of residency, I was working in a field called neurodevelopmental disabilities, working with kids with autism and ADHD. And I was like, you know what? There is such a place for mind-body practices here, meditation, yoga. Again, though, it was considered an outlier. It, some people were talking about it, but not a whole lot. It was considered an outlier. It was considered just very woo-woo. So now what's really exciting I can share is even within the medical field now, there is something called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which looks at um, lifestyle factors as playing an important role in the prevention and treatment of chronic health conditions. So lifestyle factors, meaning stress management. What are you doing to manage your stress? What sort of physical activity are you doing? How are you eating? all of these things that we're talking about, right? Um, there is now many more physicians who are enter entering the practice of integrative medicine, which is really integrating all of these different aspects, way more than there was back in 2010 when I was talking about this or back in 2002 when I first started practicing yoga. So for me, I find that very exciting. There's also so much more research being done and research out there on these practices and how helpful they are, how they actually, um, you know, through neuroplasticity, rewire your brain, right? So there's a lot of science behind this as well now, uh, which is really interesting. You know, my first Ayurveda teacher, when I first started studying Ayurveda, my first teacher was also a MD, medical doctor, just like myself. And he said in my very first workshop, he said, you know, Western medicine is evidence-based practice, meaning, meaning we take a look at the research, we take a look at the science, we put it into practice. 
Ayurveda and some of these Eastern practices, mindfulness, meditation, all of this is practice-based evidence. They've been practiced for thousands and thousands of years. And there's experiential evidence. Thousands and year, thousands of years, over 5,000 years of experiential evidence of how this works, right? Now, what's really exciting for me as a practitioner of both of these Eastern and Western traditions is that now modern science is also backing up those 5,000 year old practices. So it's all coming together, which is hmm. so cool and so exciting to me. Yeah, that's, it's fascinating. Cause I've been, I, as you're describing this, I was just thinking about that as well. I was like, gosh, everyone is so quick to look for some sort of medication, whatever, you know, and that's been around, uh, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, you know, whereas what you're talking, I mean, to be around for 5,000 years, whatever, I mean, that's, uh, it's an interesting way to think about it that I never thought about it before. Um, uh, cause I've definitely. Why? Cause people want a quick fix instead of yeah. actually working towards fixing it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I also think that too, I mean, I'm just not, not, uh, not that I'm putting on a tinfoil hat or I'm a conspiracy theorist ooh, by any ooh, stretch, is, but ooh. when you look at like the pharmaceutical companies and then you look at the lifetime value, if you can get somebody on medication for a long, long term, I mean, it's just like, where where is that line in terms of we really want to help you versus what is the lifetime value of having you as a as a patient well there's plenty of movies including the one dope sick that will tell you that right um, right they don't care yeah 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 there's so much that goes goes into it and there's certainly a place for both i you know both i think you sure. know certainly western medicine western pharmaceuticals are really great for you know particularly for acute managing acute conditions, right? Sudden onset sort of things, emergency situations, certainly things like that. Um, and certainly they they are needed to some to some extent, certainly obviously within chronic conditions as well. Um, but there's a lot that can also be addressed with these other practices, either as a supplement or augment that could maybe decrease the level of medications that people are on or even get them off of it altogether. And so there's definitely a place, certainly for for both of those. Um, and there is so much that goes into 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 sort of where we are now with regards to all of this, with regards to the, the healthcare system, with regards to pharmaceuticals and all of that. There's so much that goes into it on so many different levels, right? Like Zach, you mentioned sort of people looking for the quick fix. And part of that is also because that may be sort of all that they know, right? I think a lot of people, that's kind of all that they know that that's with regards to their health and well-being. And so again, that's where I think education doing, you know, shows having conversations like we're having right now is so important, but because a lot of people, that's kind of all they know and that's kind of what they expect, right? And, and a lot of people also, that's kind of all they know. And then once they reach a limit with Western medicine, with regards to what the medications are able to do or, or with regards to what we know, that's when a lot I see a lot of people start seeking other things. And you know what's interesting and and where I think some of these changes are coming with like my a lot many of my colleagues who are now exploring integrative medicine and that sort of thing, a lot of them are exploring that because of their own experiences because they've come up to limitations either with something a health condition that they're going through or a family member has been going through and they've come up against some limitations with regards to what Western medicine has been able to provide. And so they've started seeking outside of that and then seen the results of it. And now they're bringing that to their patients too. So it's really interesting because I've seen this journey with my colleagues as well. Okay. So is it, you, you use the word that I, I guess I was trying to articulate earlier. So like to go from woo-foo, woo-foo, woo-woo, to go from woo-woo, you know, kind of weird, kind of, you know, whatever frowned upon is what I called it to really pop culture. To, to really have made this mainstream, like what made that happen? Like, cause it's, this stuff is like, like you said, it's 5,000 years old. Like it, it's been there forever, but then to now to be so mainstream and have so many people do it every morning to, to, to talk about it here, you know, I'm sure there's thousands of, of, of hours, millions of hours of, of content on YouTube alone about this kind of stuff. Like it's, it's wild that 20 years ago, you were like, yeah, there are, you know, I was an anomaly. And now it's like, okay, you're just one of billions of people that are into this. Like it's a wild ride. How do we get here? 
It is. That's a great question. Gosh, I don't know if I have a great answer. I mean, I think part of it is just people experiencing it, right? And experiencing the benefits firsthand and then telling other people about it and just kind of spread. Um, I think that definitely over the past, you know, three years, I think certainly the pandemic has just accelerated that, right? I think through the pandemic, a lot of us have come to realize and and come to reevaluate what's most important in our life, right? And so, you know, talking about kind of what we were talking about earlier, that hustle culture that, you know, I think a lot of people have come to realize like, wait a second, spending time with my family is really important too. Spending time at home is really important too. And wait a second, having other interests in my life, <laughs> you know, hobbies, like that's important too. I think people are starting to, really seek that out. And we're seeing that in the workforce as well, right? Um, a lot of organizations are starting to focus on things like employee engagement initiatives and things like that to help because people are looking for that. Like they're starting to, I think it really put a lot of, they accelerated this um, for many people that like, hey, you know, it also brought to light um, just kind of our own, morbidity that we're not going to be around forever and how do I want to live my life for however long I have left right like I think it brought up a lot of these questions for a lot of people and so what I think, COVID did yeah mm -hmm. yeah and and just just going through and experiencing the pandemic and I think that brought up a lot of these questions for people and introspection and I think that's part of what certainly at least over the past three years has accelerated this movement I want to make sure where where are we now in the six uh, six steps. I want to make sure that we I, for people that are listening, it'd be like they only talked about the first one or the first two. But so can we yeah. can we circle back around just to make sure that we can cover all those? Absolutely, great question. I know it's so that's the thing. <laughs> we Each only did two. So powerful. We only did two. <laughs> <laughs> Each of these is so powerful. Um, so yeah, so as a refresher, the first phase of the car, so it's clarity, acceptance, rebuilding. The first phase was clarity. The two steps there is taking inventory and then creating empowering daily routines. The next phase is acceptance. And so acceptance in my program is all about cultivating that mind-body connection. So kind of coming around full circle to something we talked about earlier that our body is always sending us signals, but so often we're tuning it out. We're not aware of it. And also so often we spend most of our day in our mind, in our head. And so just really disconnected. A lot of us, uh, especially in stressful situations, burnout, whatever it is, life transitions, our nervous system is really dysregulated as well. And so starting to cultivate that mind-body connection, the other thing that that does is when we cultivate the mind-body connection, when we ground ourselves in our body, we are very much in the present moment. When we're in our head, we're often in the past or in the future. When we're in our body, we are here, we are now. And this is the only place that you can make any change or transformation from. And so the two steps within that acceptance phase are mindful movement and mindful eating. So we look at movement practices. We look at, which does not have to be yoga for everyone, right? <laughs> yoga is a tool that I use, but as I mentioned, I also use dance, right? So it can look different for all of us. Um, and then looking at mindful eating and just the relationship that we have with, with our food and how that affects our physical body as well. And then the third phase is rebuilding. And so rebuilding, so the first two phases, clarity, acceptance, we're really doing a lot of that inner work, right? And and just as, as we discussed here, I mean, even with those two uh, first steps, there's so much depth that we can go into there. So I always say, you know, we're starting with that inner work, but don't be fooled. Like you start to notice changes in your external world, even when, like, especially when you start to do that inner work. But it's the third phase, that rebuilding phase, where we are actually actively and intentionally looking at our external world now from this place of having done a lot of this inner work. And so the fifth step there is career and relationships, which is really all about setting boundaries. So I walk people through a framework for setting boundaries, professional, personal, and inner boundaries. And then the final step is, the sixth step is celebration. So I guide people to finding ways to celebrate your small wins on a regular basis. So often we wait for something really big or we think something really big needs to happen to celebrate or to feel proud of yourself or um, to give yourself some credit for. And, and really it's those celebrating those small daily wins on a regular basis 
for all of us, and certainly in entrepreneurship, the ups and downs of entrepreneurship is so valuable to celebrate those small wins. And I really believe that that is truly the key to fulfillment is finding those ways on a daily basis. And celebration doesn't mean necessarily like you're taking yourself out to dinner every night or you're throwing yourself a big party. It's really just taking a moment to honor and acknowledge and say, yeah, I did that today, right? Like so often by the end of the day, we can think of still how, we can think of how far we still are from our goals or we can think about how much more there's left to do or what we didn't get to. But what if at the end of the day, we think about what you did do, what you did achieve, what you did yeah. get done. I think sometimes even just, just to piggyback off of that, like from a reward perspective or a celebration perspective, it's like, okay, that was a good run. Yes. It was like, oh, you just got that client. Yes. Oh, you got this meeting. Yes. Like these little things. And it's just like, you're, you're, I don't know if it's a dopamine effect or whatever, but you are just kind of like quickly being like, yo, add a boy, like you did good. Like, good job, kid. Like, cause I think oftentimes we are a little harder on ourselves or we're like, oh, you have to be perfect every single day. And it's just like, yo, like, do the majority of this stuff as is, is often as possible and celebrate when when something goes good. If it went bad, figure out why too. Like I think a lot of people don't take that next step. Like, okay, like why did you have a bad run? Why did you have a bad meeting? Why did, why, what, like what happened here? Like, you know, and sometimes it will be technology that just doesn't work and you just got to roll with the punches, but sometimes you can control it. And it's like, okay, well, the person didn't show up to your meeting because you, even though they're on the calendar, and they accepted it, you forgot to email them the day before to say, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. It could have been something as simple as that to, to fix that challenge when, you know, you're sitting here and, and, you know, you got the three minutes at the dance class that you're waiting, call the six people that you're meeting tomorrow or, or email those six people and say, see you tomorrow, see you tomorrow, see you tomorrow. See you. Like you can get a lot done, work on, well, work on, on constantly improving. Yeah, absolutely. And even to take that even in another step and 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 kind of another angle as well. Like if you had a, a a bad run or a bad meeting, can you celebrate, well, yeah, that wasn't my best run, but you know what? I showed up. Yes. I did that. I still did it. Right. Even though it wasn't great, I still did it. I still well, showed up for that today. What's Nike's motto, right? What's their whole Just thing? Do Just it. do it. Yep. Most people don't do it. Is that, I mean, is that literally the greatest tagline of all time? I mean, it probably is, you know, just do it. Who cares how good or bad you are? Just do it. And then, you know, at the end of it, learn from it. Just do it again. So that said, Zach, I'm curious, what what do you say to the people that they just are always like the desire to be good enough, the desire to be accepted and the stress that people have to just compete or for that acceptance? How, I mean, that's a huge amount of stress that a lot of people have. It is huge. Um, I mean, it is, is huge. It, 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 wow. Yeah. It's great. No, it's a great question because um, I think that's a journey that I've certainly navigated and I'm still navigating as well in many ways, right? I, I don't know. I think it's just like a, a life journey it's um i mean just the, like the amount the of imposter syndrome that yeah. founders have is is enormous and it's just not talked about i mean it's, yeah. it's really it's, it's significant and it's really you know it's funny it's it's really not funny but it's interesting because this is really the premise of the book that i'm writing right now so mm. i've written a first draft of a book and this is really the premise of it is like is 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 how can we stop you know, how can we step away from literally like killing ourselves to meet everyone else's expectations or what we think everyone else's expectations are of us and start listening to our inner voice and living a life that feels true to us. And I don't think there's an easy or a quick answer. So going back to like, there's no yeah. sort of quick fix. I do think, you know, a, a lot of sort of my program and, and the things that I, that, that I guide people through certainly helps to, you know, guide people to start listening to and trusting their inner voice. Um, I think a lot of discord and distress in our lives comes from not living in, in, line, in alignment with our inner truth. And I think that's where we feel a lot of that st stress and discord and misalignment. And so 
certainly this path that I laid out, these six steps is a starting point. I think um, community is important. I think having these conversations is important to let people know that like you're not alone in what you're feeling and that we're all feeling, you know, that some of these things to different extents. What I really love, and that's why I mentioned about the Ayurveda earlier about how it really sees everyone as individual and unique. I really love that. And, and that's certainly been a big tool for me and which is part of why I, I share that so much with other people too, of just really recognizing that you were born with this specific set of qualities and traits and interests and strengths to fulfill your unique purpose in life. And that is a hundred percent completely different than anyone else's. And I think what that does, what that's done for me, what it's done for my clients is allows us to step into a space of greater self-compassion, of self-love, of honoring these quote unquote differences. Like I don't need to look or act a certain way or meet the certain expectation. I need to be true to myself. And again, I think this is a hard journey. This is a journey that I've been on and it's a journey that I am still on a hundred percent still on this journey. But what I can do is I can share what I've learned along the way so far. <laughs> And with that, I'm sure that you, what you're what you have said has resonated with many, many people, everyone that listened. What is the best way to get in touch with you, contact you, and have the, continue the conversation with you? We'll make sure that we put everything everything in the show notes. But what's the best way to get in touch with you? Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. So you can find me at my website, radiantlivinginstitute.com. And when you go to that website, you'll also see that you can download a free workbook, which goes through these six steps that I outlined here today. So you can just download that workbook completely free. Give yourself 20 minutes to just work through and answer some of the questions. I guarantee you'll find some clarity there. So that's a great first step. I'm also on, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Instagram at Sheetal Ajmani, MD. And feel free to send me a DM, connect with me on any of those. And, and the name of your podcast one more time? Essential Self-Care, and it's anywhere you listen to podcasts. Awesome. What uh, What is something that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about as as we wrap um, I think we covered so much great stuff. So I think actually just to kind of recap and highlight a couple of points, just a reminder that a radiant life really starts from within. Take that time to go within. It can feel uncomfortable. It can feel hard when you're first starting, but also know that it doesn't have to be long. Start small, maybe just a minute or two. Find something or try to maybe reconnect with something that gives you joy and maybe start there to make that starting point as easy as possible for you. And if you're having trouble thinking of something to start with, go to my website, radiantlivinginstitute.com, download that workbook. It is a perfect starting point for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was uh, great talking to you. Uh, we could talk hours about this. I'd love to have you back sometime where we can expand on it even further, but I uh, really, really appreciate your time. Zach, any closing thoughts? I got to go meditate, so... <laughs> well they always say you know like the people that say that they don't have time to meditate are the ones that need it the most and i feel like i fall into that category so Absolutely. it was a good reminder thank you for having me here thank you